All right, welcome back to episode 31 of the 20 Pages Book Club. On today's episode, uh, before we get into our new book, we're going to talk about some books that we're reading on the side um, in our lull between uh, past book and our current book. Um, some of the members have picked up uh, something on the side to read, so we're going to talk about those books that we've been reading. Um, then we get into our third book of the year, Then Different Stars Above, talking through chapters one through six, uh, also giving our thoughts throughout, throughout thus far. Um, and then we do Scriblio. We'll see if Christian can defend his title um, while Kevin tries to, for some revenge. Um, and then we'll talk about what's 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 the plan for moving forward. So looking forward to a great up ep great episode. Let's go. All right, welcome back, episode 31. Um, like we said, first episode for the Different Stars Above. But before we dig into uh, the, the beginning chapters of that, um, I thought we could talk about some of the books we've been reading on the side. I know um, since we had a couple weeks off, uh, some members picked up some other books. So um, would someone like to start on what they're reading on the side and, and their thoughts thus far on what they're reading? Okay, uh, I will go first, guys, guys, no guys. All right. Thanks. I am reading uh, In the Shadow of Lightning uh, by Brian McKellen. Uh, basically, the plot is, I'm only 80 pages in, so I'm not that far, but the plot is uh, there's this magic user. Uh, he's very distinguished, and he's a general within the army. Anyways, he gets scarred after they massacre a village, and he leaves the army, uh, but some unforeseen events re relating to his mom and her death cause him to uh come back home and come back in the limelight so i'm on page 80 so it's got some good humor in it i will give it that so far is it a series or one one book it is going to be a series it is book one the book came out either last year or this year so this is the first book i just looked up um, reviews on goodreads it said poor man's babel or Babel, do you like to comment on that? <laughs> um, was that was that Kevin HD Gamer twenty eight that reviewed? Don't give out my calling card like that. Okay, <laughs> that's personal information. You're okay. basically giving out a social security number. <laughs> okay. My bad, Christian. Bold, bold of you to pick up a a series that is incomplete. I have to wait. I already get. I already have that with the name of the Wind series. I'm probably gonna read Game of Thrones eventually, so I'm gonna have that as well. So. I think I've just accepted I, it. I refuse to pick up Game of Thrones until the last book is released. Well, he's got two books to go. Oh, it's not the last. The Winds of Winter that's coming out is the second to last book. Well, I just maybe. Yeah, he's in his sixties now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he may die. He, can, he might have to hurry. It does up. he have a? Does he have a son? We know how that goes from the Tolkien he's, family he's, and the family. He's 75, so we might be screwed. Speaking of Game of Thrones, maybe we should make an uh, a a pagey called book most re or most based off of Game of Thrones because I know one of the families <laughs> in this book is named the Stark family, which is probably based off the Game of Thrones. So. We should do no, we should rename the worst ending award to the Game of Thrones award. No. Nah. Okay. Christian, what book are you reading on the side? Swing and a miss. Uh, you guys like the Game of Thrones. I'm reading. I've got, got it. Uh -huh. I'm reading uh, recently adapted into TV series where the first episodes aired uh, this past Tuesday, Tuesday, February 27th. Um, Shogun. It's broken up. I bought the two part series. So this is part one. Finish part one. I'm on to part two. Uh, they're like 1,200 pages in total. And it is about an Englishman uh, in the 1600s uh, named John B Blackthorne, who uh, him and his crew wash up uh, on the shores of feudal Japan. Uh, I, we figured this out the other day, but feudal basically meaning uh, the so socioeconomic structure of Japan at the time. It was a time of civil war. Um, he arrives on the, the shores and... Um, does his best to survive and close the and climb the uh social political ladder um yeah very interesting uh i think 
the TV show is supposed to be just one season. Um, well, the first season is supposed to cover the entire book. It's supposed to be a quote unquote miniseries. It's been adapted to before in the 1980s. And uh, they have talked about expanding the miniseries beyond what the book covers if there's enough fan interest. So uh, excited to, to see where it goes. I started watching the show with them. The show is very good up to this point. So I'm excited to see what they do with the rest of it. Yeah. There, there's a ton of characters, um, a ton of like political intricacies. Uh, it's a little complicated, and the the first like two three hundred pages of the book, like yeah, there was a lot of action involved, but most of it is like introduction to characters and introduction to the the culture of Japan at the time and and how things worked. Um, but I have enjoyed it so far. I've finished part one in like a whole week, so. I'm gonna finish part two before the the series gets there. Yeah, that's me. It's to Jared. Well, your your mic did like <laughs> was like cutting it out. Um, I'm reading uh, Bad Blood. Um, it's a nonfiction book uh, talking about Elizabeth Holmes. Um, if you're not aware of what she did, um, you probably recently saw her in the news going to jail because uh, she was. Basically, uh, the CEO of the biggest like business scandal since Enron. Um, so, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of crazy stuff happened there. I'm only about 100 pages in, so not too much detail. But, uh, yeah, she started a company called Theranos. If you look it up, you'll see the, a lot of stories about um, its shortfalls and, down, and downfall. So, I, can't, I don't know too much about stories. So that's why I was interested in reading it. Um, I thought I was going to actually finish it before I started Different Stars Above, but I've kind of been busy on the side, so hopefully I plan to, to read some more. But, yeah, interesting story. Kevin? Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm reading Shoe Dog. Jared, you were right. This is I, I've i loved it so far. It's been pretty insane. Uh, the main, main part of the story is there. there's a young man Bill Knight, who wants to start his own shoe business, and he goes to his dad. He's like, "Hey, give me, give me money, give me money," and his dad like kind of helps him at first. Goes across, goes all over the world, goes to Japan. Really, and he tries to bring J Japanese shoes to the Americas, and it's it's very interesting seeing how he deals with like the Japanese businessmen, and it's right after uh, the end of World War II and stuff. So there's a lot there's a lot going on during that time. And I've liked it a lot. I have been trying to listen to books while running because I've gotten bored of listening to music. So I did listen to some of that while running and I started The Indifferent Stars Above while running. Very hard to stay focused listening to books while running. So forgive me if the first couple chapters I don't have very much input because I may not remember them very well. Uh, but yeah. But so far, I love the book. It's about yeah. running, which is something I've been getting really into now. So, was yeah. his company successful in the end? <laughs> no, it actually got bought out by Adidas. I don't even remember what the company ends up being called, but yeah, Whoosh. yeah, uh, shoot out great book. Uh, I've scored an eight five. Interested to see where Kevin Kevin scores it. So, wow. All right. yeah. So many people I work with talk about like audiobooks. I have never been able to get into it. When I went to Steamboat last weekend, we we drove and it was like 14 hours. So we we were like, all right, we're going to have to put on an audiobook or something because and we actually we listened to some of Shoe Dog. I gave my buddy that was driving with a summary of what I what he hadn't read yet and then we just turned it on. And it was actually like it made time pass by pretty fast in the car, but if I'm like when I'm running, I'm listening for like the first five minutes and all of a sudden I'm like thinking about other stuff and I'm like, oh, I just did not comprehend anything that was just said. The only audiobook that I've actually enjoyed was uh, Matthew McConaughey's uh, memoir, Green Lights, because he's the one that actually is narrating it and he can tell a story. So it really flows well. And I yeah, to, in like a day, day and a half, because it was so good. My, my experience is that 
it all depends on the person reading it. If they can like breathe life into the life into the story with their voice, it's it's really good. But sometimes I've listened to a couple where it's just like it almost sounds like an AI voice or an old man just like reading the words on the page, and you're like, start you know, you start snoozing. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, but I actually have the Green Lights book, uh, Matthew McConaughey version. If anyone wants it, so I have the link to it. Or the download of it. Is that legal? Um, but <laughs> I I don't know. I downloaded it off Audible, so I think I I think I bought it. I don't know. It's like those old VHS things that would play, like the FBI thing at the start of uh, a DVD or a VHS. All right, that may have dated me a little bit. Um... Yeah, I was just gonna say, you put yourself out I there. Know, I, I know what he's talking about, but I just didn't say anything because I left them out, left them out to dry. Okay. Well, that's appreciated. A true friend right there. Uh, anything else before we begin uh, the chapter or the Indifferent Stars Above? Uh, I guess maybe in the coming weeks we'll, we'll update what we score, the books we've been reading, because um, yeah. eventually 20 pages will hopefully turn into a website where everyone can see our scores, because that would be a lot easier. Um, but yeah, it's good to, good to see what we rate stuff that's not in the book club, uh, so, we can, so we can gauge. But yeah. Yeah, Tyler, especially, especially books that get re or read by multiple people, you know. Um, all right. Um, I will start off with the prologue. I'm just going to zoom through this. I'm going to assume nobody has any thoughts, but I will read it just in case. All right, prologue. Uh, author details that he has an affinity for Bones. The author details his personal connection to the story, a connection between his father's uncle, George W. Tucker, and the main character of the story, Sarah Graves. Both had journeyed together over 150 years ago. Daniel Brown then details the diary accounts of a doctor, Wakeman Byerly, who stumbled upon the bones of the journey people in 1949. That may be 1849, but three years after their burial. Uh, yeah, definitely 1849. Detailing the beauty of the location, but the desperation and brutality of these people's remains. With his curiosity and personal connection, Daniel Brown felt the necessity to tell Sarah Graves' story. Given this, through several hiking trips and thousands of retraced steps, he set out to tell the following story. Um, besides the author really liking and, and, Bones. Yeah, that the the start of the book was a little weird. I was questioning what we were getting into here. <laughs> I think I think I, I told Christian sometimes you just gotta skip the prologue. Sometimes sometimes you just gotta hit the skip button. I read the prologue and then read and then put off starting to read this book because of the prologue yeah. for like the next two, two days. I did the same. I read the prologue twice and I was like, I don't know if I can start this book right now. Hi, my name is Dan Daniel James Brown, and my strange addiction is <laughs> bones. Bones. It sounds, it sounds he like he likes to them. play with them. I'm sorry. Yeah, Daniel Brown. He didn't, too. He, was, he didn't do a good job of making us want to read the book. No. Well, I'll say that. No, I he did. Uh, if if uh red notice was one of the best starts that we've ever read i think we all said that like this may have been one of the worst starts to a book that i've read so far yeah to be fair it was almost so bad that it was good though i was like all right what what's going on like i have to i have to figure out what what is going he's, on he's going on like on a road trip to go just see some bones human bones <laughs> the one thing i'll say to it it wasn't that long so at least that was and do people even consider the prologue like the a, I, like part of the book? Like yeah. I don't know. Uh, he true. also mentioned his his Go great ahead. uncle twice, like one of those uh, like frat boys who's like my dad's a lawyer. Like he kept he kept mentioning like George Wash George W. Tucker. Yeah, yeah. I think I think ultimately, maybe, maybe sometimes it's better if the author doesn't write the prologue, but someone one of their friends writes it for them. I've seen that in a couple of books um, because it, it does a better job at selling the book. You know, the only thing I picked up from the prologue was that uh, the reason why he picked Sarah Graves is the, the focal yeah. point. And even then I was still a little bit confused because like there wasn't like she was writing diaries or anything like at least from what no. we've seen. So like, I was a little confused on the selection. I was, I was a little concerned at his wording about how like, there's not much known about Sarah Graves and what she went through, uh, which is concerning considering the whole story surrounds Sarah Graves. I was going to bring that up later when 
Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here where it's like, and they don't really know what happened to him. <laughs> they don't really know what happened to her. Yeah. Possibly. I think. I think like there's a there's a good chance Sarah and Jay could have done this and that and this. You're dealing with diaries, which aren't truthful in any sort of the way. I think. I think the book. Like it does a bad job. It's it's telling you it follows Sarah's story, but like, not really. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, it's weird the way he writes it. It's like three different. He talks about like the group as a whole, Sarah in specific, or the Graves family in specific, and then like he also gives like his own personal take. Like back then, like or like today, he'll say like today in the 21st century, this is like different. Like he'll put like perspective and on it. Like it's yeah, weird, like the way that. No, I'm not saying it bothers me. I'm just saying the way that he's written it is is a little bit different. Yeah, I think I think I honestly what this just tells me is the marketing behind this is not very good. <laughs> like him selling the book is not very good, but um, somehow we all ended up with it. Yeah, somehow we ended up. With it. <laughs> it sold you. It sold you. Wait, it hasn't really sold you. Yeah, you brought you brought up the marketing, but then you're the one that put the book. <laughs> you guys all voted for it. Touche. You didn't give us many options. <laughs> yeah, we had three choices. <laughs> Touche. It wasn't my number one. I will say that of yours. You you were the one that created the marketing for it after getting marketed on. <laughs> so maybe yeah. I should have marketed the book for him. Basically. Okay, that's what we have. All right. All right. All right we've done a Bobby. great <laughs> great job of shitting on the book completely here in the prologue. We just, we, we just shit on the prologue. We haven't even started the book. <laughs> Well, I I think the book's a different story than the prologue, so uh Is it? <laughs> Stay tuned. Um all right. A part one, a sprightly boy and a romping girl. Uh well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that's what part one was called. Are you, are you guys gonna be okay? Right. Also yeah. can we talk about the title really quick? Going back on the marketing, like I would have no idea what this would this book would be about if it didn't say like the harrowing saga of the Donner Party. Honestly, it probably should just call it the Donner Party. Sarah Graves and the Donner Party. That's probably what it should just be called. Or some or like diaries of the Donner Party. Yeah. There. A little a little alliteration in there as well. God, you guys we need to get your you guys need a package, make an LLC, <laughs> make a marketing team. I, makes me wonder what the boys in the boat's about. <laughs> yeah, at, least, at least you got a little bit more to the point with boys in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really about boys in a boat? That's girls in the car. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right, we had our phone. All right, chapter one, Home and Heart. Uh, Sarah and her family would set out from Illinois to California on April 12th, 1846, starting the journey at the crack of dawn. Pulled by oxen, their wagon would contain their most valuable items and Sarah's eight younger siblings. However, the decision wasn't easy for Sarah. She was in love. The man was Jay Fosdick, and she was his fiance. Like Sarah, he was torn. His father needed his hands on the local farm. He couldn't afford Jay leaving. Sarah's parents, Franklin Ward and Elizabeth Graves, were well liked in the community. It puzzled many within their community why they would leave. Like those in his family before him, Franklin opted to head west in search of cheaper and larger land, or land that was farmable. That led him to Dearborn, Indiana, which later led him to Lacan, Illinois a city set upon the Illinois River. While the land was promising and the native neighbors were kind, great sickness ravaged the valley. From yellow uh, fever to cholera, um, only later would the world understand the source of these frequent illnesses, a parasite's malaria. The river was a perfect home for the most common carrier, the mosquito. However, there was another major factor, an economic collapse from speculative real estate, never seen that before, in the late 1830s. Banks across the country failed as a result. Soon enough, the wheat that the graves grew was nearly worth nothing. By the 19th or 1840s, I keep writing 19 in here, some hope came around, a tale of a place in the West that was rich in farmland and natural beauty. California. Uh, settlers claimed it had the perfect climate. Uh, then, in 1845, Lansford Warren Hastings published The Immigrant's Guide. It swept through the center of the country like a hurricane. It didn't matter that the British had made claims towards Oregon and California was considered Mexican territory. Settlers simply awed at the prospect. Hastings also concluded uh, that beneficially, the Native Americans were mostly gone. As we know now, this was due to the diseases introduced by the white settlers. 
1846, the economy was rebounding, which brought prospective buyers to the Illinois River. This was the case for George Sparr, who bought the farmland off Franklin for $15,000, or I did the inflation calculator as $500,000 in today's money, all 150 acres. Across the country was a man named James or John Sutter. His goal was to establish a community called Sutterville. To do this, he frequently took action against the nearby Miwok Indians. With the help of Hastings, Sutter began to build this future metropolis in Northern California. However, there was con one concern. Hastings had also been singing the praises of Oregon, who immigrants saw as more reachable. Despite this, Hastings had inadvertently included a clue about a shortcut, one that would hasten the travel to California. So, on April 11, 1846, Hastings left the Sacramento Valley to meet the group of travelers, including the graves, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. <clears throat> it's it's going to be tough with the how long I wrote these summaries. That was a big mistake. Yeah, this is a, yeah, a lot of water. A lot of water is going to be at the drink. But, um, you know, I think the first chapter is just an introduction to the characters we're meeting and why they're actually traveling west. I guess I didn't expect anything different from the first chapter. Anyone shocked by what was included? No, I was uh, taken aback. Like, I've never really sat down and thought about it. But the fact that only two generations ago, we were expanding west to California. Like, I, f I feel like it, w it should feel so much longer ago that we were doing so too if that makes sense yeah two generations his great uncle was in the party yeah but he's also like 60 so maybe like <laughs> wait maybe... all right wait i'm a little off it's definitely like four, four three or four for us okay uh still no no still i get still. what you i get what you mean though yeah i yeah, it really wasn't that long ago, and like it's crazy. Like I, for, you know, you forget it. the Mexican American War is frequently forgotten. I forget it all the time, uh, and that wasn't even that long ago. Uh, and then this was before um, we had much of the central part of the country as well. So like America was, I don't know how many states exactly, probably like twenty four at this time. Yeah, well, Illinois was what was it thirteen? That was the colonies. No, yeah, 20, 26 maybe. So it, it it is like obviously St. Louis has the name the gateway, you know, state, but I you forget that the country was like it wasn't part of America for the longest time. St. Louis was kind of the most west you could go. So No, yeah. I think since I since, since I've since I've gotten back into reading the 1800s has been the time period that is like filled in the most for me, like doing during reading. I know me and Christian read Bury My Heart or Wounded Knee, but this along with that book have really helped clarify some of the things about the 1800s that I had no idea what was going on in America at the time. So you only think about the Civil War, really, but there was a lot that happened leading up to the Civil War. I think you'd like an end of Revolutionary War and beginning of Civil War. I don't want to say it's the fault of like the way our education system works, but like a lot of at least, I don't know, but I feel like a lot of college courses teach, like, history, U.S. history before the Civil War and U.S. history after the Civil War. And, like, a lot of the 1800s gets lost because, like, it just views, like, it doesn't go up to the Civil War necessarily, you know? Like, it just, it uses the Civil War as the main event in the 1800s, which obviously it was in America. But, like, there's so much post-revolution that uh, is important. So, i I don't think I took a history class in, in college. Now that I think of it. Yeah, I took high school. Like, France in the nineteen twenties. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> the only thing you learn in high school is like manifest destiny, but you don't you don't really discuss what that meant for America. I don't, or what we did yeah. to accomplish that. I don't. I guess that brings up another thing that I'm interested to talk about. Maybe not right now, but as this develops, especially Jared and Christian's opinion is. This is a book that's kind of written. <laughs> what? <laughs> Basically said everyone, but Kevin. Uh, well, no, I mean, I mean, no, because let me finish what I'm saying, because this is a book written. You guys have read a lot about Native American history, uh, especially in the 1800s through Barry Marr, Wood with Wheat Knee. So this this book is is told from the from the settlers perspective. So it's interesting to see what their thoughts were um, traveling west. No, um, that's, that's true. 
I'm not gonna lie, I read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, but I don't remember a lot of the details. So I just remember the big concepts. Uh I did notice that like uh um this author, whatever his name is, James Gordon or something. He uh <laughs> James Brown. <laughs> James Brown. <laughs> yeah. Daniel James Brown. Uh he only really talks about the white settlers' perspective of like the Indians and how they viewed them as opposed to how the Indians viewed the white settlers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say Barry My Heart of is different in the fact that you have like 17 accounts of different tribes. So it's like Christian said, it's very hard to I under I know like the big tribes, but it's very hard to remember some of the small uh, the smaller tribes that get mentioned, but I was trying to actually recall and see the ones that they talk about in Northern California and Oregon are the ones that they're talking about in this book. But um, a lot of that, I feel like a lot of that book too was post. It was later, post Civil War. Yeah, it was like I think it was eighteen eighties to nineteen twenties. I want to say, but because a lot of yeah. the landscape had changed already, and and a lot of those that manifest destiny already happened but i'll have to go back and, and look yeah all right chapter two <clears throat> mud and merchandise the spring was nasty filled with rain sleet and snow however the graves ventured towards saint joseph missouri there they could gather up a traveling party first they had to make it there it was a tough it was tough sledding frequent water obstacles made it difficult and required frequent ingenuity in total, they traveled in three wagons, one driven by Franklin, which contained Elizabeth and the silver, one driven by Jay, her fiancé, and Sarah followed. Finally, a stranger, John Snyder, drove the last containing all of the other children. The journey continued on as spring began to take shape. Across the way, events were unfolding that would shape their journey. On May 12th, a party of immigrants from Missouri ventured towards California. A successful businessman named James Fraser Reed led the journey in his extravagant wagon, an 1800s version of an RV. Traveling in that group was George and Jacob Donner, George in his early 60s and successful, and successful Jacob 56 and seemingly less successful. Despite this, they journeyed with the other hopefuls to California. That's a strange stray that he got in that book. Uh, on May 13th, events unfolded in the East. James Polk declared war on Mexico, the prize at stake of new territory, specifically Texas, California, and New Mexico, and parts of Colorado and Wyoming. Polk was largely backed by the United States public. As such, Congress passed his war bill 42 to 2. Imagine seeing that partisanship today. Uh, meanwhile, a young Al Abraham Lincoln would arrive in Lincoln to campaign for Congress. Nice fun. Abraham, you haven't spelled Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> He's Muslim. But I said, <laughs> I said it right, so it's all right. Uh, on May 19th, uh, the Reed Party joined forces with Colonel William Russell. On May 20th, Hastings was also making moves in modern-day Nevada. He had been journeying with James Clyman, well-regarded as one of the country's great mountain men and explorers. They debated the concept of Hastings' shortcut, which Kleinman rejected. Nonetheless, Hastings convinced them to try it. Meanwhile, the journey for the graves carried on. Frequently, they traveled alongside other groups, taking advantage of safety in numbers. Most days consisted of walking, with a few hours for socializing and grazing. By mid-May, they had nearly reached St. Joe's. The local newspaper marveled at the prospect of this party and the frequent parties that passed through this town. All traveled with great hope. As a crossroads town, St. Joe's attracted almost everything and almost everyone. Most of all, it served as the last chance for any travelers to see a doctor before they exited the United States, and a last stop for supplies. In particular, Sarah was tasked with finding the right amount of flour, sugar, and baking powder. For the men, they looked for wagon repair equipment and protection in the form of guns. By the end of it all, it was likely that each wagon weighed nearly 3,000 pounds. Materials weren't the only form of necessity in St. Joe's. Most travelers looked for advice. Most potent of the kind at the time was the story of the Meek Party. A trapper from Oregon, Stephen Meek, had taken a party off the Oregon Trail on a shortcut. Soon enough, it became clear that Stephen was lost. As a result, the party was suffering and the livestock was dying. The events turned worse as they reached Central Oregon. Food and water started to become an issue, and soon enough, people were dying in large groups. Meek went ahead of the group and finally stumbled upon a settlement, pleading for help, but unwilling to face the group. With that, a freed slave, Moses Black Harris, 
stepped up, regarded as one of the top mountain men, and he saved the meat party. Despite his efforts, more than 50 still passed from the conditions. Uh, as late May approached, Sarah and her family looked to join a group amassing in Parrot's Landing. They were headed to Oregon, but the family needed the company. Uh, at this point, they were officially leaving the United States behind. While they were well prepared, they had avoided a critical part of Hastings' advice, never leave after May 1st. By then, the trip would prove almost impossible. By the day they had boarded the ferry, it was already three weeks past that date. Uh, so first motor more out of the moment of the book, and we're, I'm, I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of them uh, as we go over, but uh, there's two pieces of advice that stood out to me. This chapter was, one, they tell this entire story about this guy that was popular at the time, this meat guy, that taking a shortcut is probably not your best option. Going along the, the road traveled is probably your safest option in terms of exploring west, and two, um, leaving at a particular time is very important. Uh, obviously, because it's going to take you months. So you have to be prepared to make it there before winter hits. Uh, anything stand out from you from chapter two? I was going to say the exact same thing. There, Someone needs to be nominated for Motor Moron. I don't know if it's Hastings, but he was also just trying to do business. I don't know if it's him. I don't know if it's the people that followed his advice. I don't know who it should be nominated, but someone needs to be nominated from this book because the mistakes that were made to lead to what the events that are that are unfolding is crazy. Uh, I blame Hastings. I think it's wild to tell immigrants traveling west to take a shortcut that you've never actually taken yourself. And then the same year they were traveling, he decided to go and take it. And the guy that he traveled with was some sort of mountain man. And uh, he's like, yeah, this is pretty treacherous. You should not be telling people to take it. And then he just doubled down on the advice that he gave and continued to tell the travelers to take this shortcut. The funniest part is, um, like they they mentioned that they were struggling to even make it out of it, just themselves on horseback. And it's like, it's the next logical step is, can people make it through with wagons and ox? And it's like, well, if you could barely make it through with a horse, I'm gonna I'm gonna say doubtful. But he was after money. Greed. Greed is a powerful tool. To Christian's point earlier, it is crazy how three to four generations ago, you would have to, if you wanted to go to the West Coast, you're you're packing up your your wagon and you're walking. And now Jerry can just hop on a flight and be in San Francisco in two hours. On a weekly basis. <laughs> Which yeah. is where I propose the idea to pay homage to our ancestors and to this book. <laughs> Do we start in Lacan, Illinois? <laughs> we quit. We all quit our jobs and just start walking to California in honor of the, the daughter party. <laughs> Kevin, I, I don't, I don't know what we to tell to you about, about Western Nebraska, but uh, it is very I boring. It last week. Yep. Yeah. It can't be much more boring than Southern Illinois. It would also be so much different. Like we could just stop at McDonald's for breakfast yeah. or something. We should we should have to live off the land and walk, walk, walk to the, walk the wagon, Sacramento Valley. I'm just like Tyler on all fours, the wagon in the desk room. We'll get like, he obviously can't use his glasses. He literally has to live like they were back in the 1800s. So glasses. We're just walking. Uh, we're walking down the road with we, rifles and a wife behind us. We got to anti-vax for at least like two or three years before we do this. Yeah. Oh my God. No malaria meds. All right. We'll we'll bookmark that idea. We'll come back to it. We even have to leave after May first. <laughs> if we get to fifty subscribers, we'll do it. <laughs> imagine if we did it. Imagine if we did it this year. We would have been screwed right now with the daughter pass. <laughs> yeah. The best part is that if we give up, we could just like walk three miles to some hotel. And... Yeah. Just get an Uber. Of dying. Yeah. <laughs> it's too tough. All right. Chapter three Grass. Uh, Sarah Graves and her family arrived at a temporary village looking for travel companions. It didn't take long. They found Colonel Matthew. Dill Ritchie and his family, in addition, a friendship with Reason Penelope Tucker and his sons. All shared one thing they believed in, liberty, being patriotic, and exploring the frontier. 
With these new friends, they broke camp on May 23rd. At about 50 miles, they found the last evidence of American civilization, Fort Kearney in Nebraska. Many nights were spent on Indian Watch. Many viewed it as a premier threat to the traveling party. Uh, many had a preconceived notion of the Prairie Indians due to their experiences in the Army, specifically the Black Hawk War. In 1834, a warrior named Makatai Mishikai Kayak, or Black Hawk, returned with a thousand Indians deter determined to return to their homeland. However, groups loosely affiliated with Black Hawk also joined the movement and caused terror. On May 20th, 1834, 80 Potawatomi warriors slaughtered a white settlement near Starved Rock. The event caused many to join the Illinois militia. As a result, a series of one-sided battles saw the Illinois militia and one-third of the U.S. Army track down the Black Hawk tribe. In the end, they caught up to the settlement at the Battle of Bad Axe, where they slaughtered most of them, including the women and children. Black Hawk was captured later on and returned to live out his life in Iowa. Despite these stories, the current Prairie Indians were not a threat. The settlers hadn't made a large impact on the livestock as of yet. In the years to come, the mass slaughter of livestock, including buffalo, buffalo would change this relationship. For now, the settlers had little to worry. Um, Sarah and the settlers continued to pass through the prairie land 100 miles to the west. The Donna, Reed, and Russell party struggled on their journey in Kansas, being forced to create a ferry to cross bodies of water that had developed due to flooding. By the second week of June, the weather had turned dry. Sarah and her family continued on. By this time, the travelers had started getting closer. Most of the young adults and teens had realized that it was highly likely their future spouses were among them. With that, they spent most nights hanging with each other by the firelight. While the journey was tough, most believed in the destination in which they were headed for now. Uh, some cool history about the Blackhawk and Potawatomi tribes, uh, specifically for us, because we are northern Illinois residents, so... Uh, two tribes that played a big part in Illinois history. Um, so, any thoughts on some of that? This was. I had no idea about the Black Hawk War. Um, so, that was interesting. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, There's a pond up by my uh, my childhood home called Black Hawk Pond. I caught three largemouth bass on a, a topwater spinner back in 2016 with Jared. So, yeah. Oh, Podwater Me Park, that. too. Yeah, Potomac 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 Park, right by our home. Um, there's some great, uh, if you actually go through Potawatomi Park and read some of the plaques, there's some good uh, Potawatomi tribe history that you can. I was going to say, is the statue in, in Potawatomi Park, is that a Blackhawk? I don't remember who it was. I don't think it is a Blackhawk. I can ask, but I, I think I know may know who to ask, but um, I'll say. <laughs> all right <laughs> you know a guy or i know a guy uh no i think i think you know, obviously i could probably just i could probably just ask google i know a guy it's called google let me let me look really quick if, if, if they were if you saw these guys laughing on the side there was someone that typed something about the chicago blackhawks um i obviously the chicago blackhawks um named their team in honor of chief blackhawk because you know post these events many viewed Chief Blackhawk is honorable and a fierce warrior and someone to look up to even among, um, you know, white Americans. So uh, it's a great honor that he's named, you know, they've named the team after him. And obviously the Blackhawks still have great relationships with the Blackhawk tribe. So great PR statement. Thank you. I was going to, I was going to say, I love how all these, like most of the people in the Donner party are people that, um, the graves traveled with like they were quote unquote veterans of the Black Hawk War. Can you call yourself a veteran if you were shooting rifles at guys who only had spearheads and arrows? Is that allowed? Were yeah. you really a yeah. yes. was it really a war? I mean, it was good a point. Good That's point. a good point. I I'm more questioning. It's like target practice. Stolen Valor. Mm. I think I think yeah. you would find that the Native Americans even though a lot of one-sided battles, they were uh, very hard uh, warriors and they did inflict damage upon the U.S. Army significantly. So, um, I have an update oh, on the that. statue. Okay. Uh, so the statue is called Equabet, um, which is a sculpture of a Potawatomi Indian that has sighted in Potawatomi Park in 1912. So um, it's a general sculpture it's not of a specific person interesting it could have been could have been 
but well, no, he was a part of the Blackhawk tribe, right? Mm, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, but means means watching over. So I guess he is watching over the River Valley. So cool history fact. Comments aside, I think I think this for me was a really cool chapter just because it related to a lot of stuff that is personal to people that live in Illinois. Um, Tyler, did you know that this was in, they started in Illinois when you picked the book? I did not. Besides that, when I read the summary. I see. <laughs> um, something else going back to the to three to four generations ago. I can't believe it was talking about their their modern medicine, and then they're like, "Yeah, we inject ourselves with mercury." Uh, or they injected themselves with mercury, and then that would ultimately like almost kill them instead of heal them. And they thought like being in more pain was good after being sick. And I was like, "What am I reading?" Basically, every medical they fact would... shared in the book, the author would write. We now know this was terrible for them. Yeah. They would uh they would like bleed themselves out. Like if they got sick, they would like cut themselves and bleed out the bad blood is what they thought they were doing. Shout out Jared's book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bad blood. Bad blood. All right. So uh oh, go ahead. uh Daniel James Brown has a weird fascination with like uh species. Like he uses the, uh, what is it called? Like the Latin name? The scientific name. When he talks, yeah, when he talks about like certain plant types and 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 bacteria and microbes, he likes to get scientific on us. Yeah. All the strands. And he has, he also has a fascination with really big people. Yeah, I don't know if anyone caught on to that, but he likes to talk about the larger human beings in the party. I think it's just because it was so different to see someone that was six foot, you know, five or six at the time. All right. Uh, chapter four. Oh, wait. We're actually driven to the part two, uh, the barren earth. Uh, so that was the end of part one. So chapter four, dust. In Sonoma, California, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. 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 Uh, Vallejo. I don't. Is What is it? Viejo. Viejo? Two L's is the Y. Yeah, okay. two L's equal a Y. Sorry, I didn't take Spanish. Viejo. Okay. Viejo. Is that correct? Viejo? Close enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mariano Guadalupe Viejo. Was <laughs> 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 Uh, all right, Mariano Guadalupe said is the undisputed ruler of the Mexican province of Alta, California. In reward, he was given expensive salary and part of the Mexican army. A Mexican-born man, he became intrigued with the idea of Mexican independence. Frustrated due to the continued revolutions within Mexico, and the opportunity came in June. A group of freelance revolutionaries stormed his home in California, demanding he surrender and declare California as independent. He invited the men to drink and agreed upon the premise. With that, he was taken prisoner and brought to James C. Fremont. Meanwhile, on June 17th, um, Tamzine Donner and his party arrived at the precise location where Sarah and her party were located. That day, they encountered Pawnee Indians who chased off their cattle and killed a member of their party, which left a widowed woman. That started the almost impossible task of being a single mother on the frontier, a nearly impossible task with the dangers presented and the difficulty of raising kids. That brings up the matter of sex. While a wave of evangelical Christian Christianity was sweeping the country, views on sex varied in complexity. But for a couple like Sarah Graves and Jay, the temptation was high. However, nobody dared to risk pregnancy on the trail. With that, Sarah and the other women turned on each other for ideas. In 1840, condoms were still made of sheepskin, which were, wasn't popular or affordable. Many women tried to time their pregnancies, but men weren't so accommodating. Uh, finally, many tried inserting chemically uh, doused sponges inside them before sex, which greatly affected their pH levels. That brought them to the idea of terminating uh, unwanted pregnancies. Due to a lack of understanding of biology, many believe pregnancy began in the second trimester, as we know it today. That's not to say they didn't know due to other factors earlier on, Many chemicals uh, were used to promote promote uh, miscarriages, many dangerous, and many we know were carried by the women of the Graves family. Um, as they continued west along the Platte River, they reached western Nebraska. Barren as it was, they passed on. They faced new challenges in terms of rattlesnakes and dust, uh, and in, in addition, dust accumulated on everything. 
Meanwhile, Oregon had gotten word of Hastings' plan to redirect travelers and were preparing to send out representatives themselves. While that plan took shape, Hastings and Jim Kleiman were um, contemplating their shortcut route and arriving, or completing, sorry, and arriving in Wyoming. There, they departed. On June 27th, Kleiman arrived at Fort Laramie, meeting the Donner and Reed party. Reed asked Kleiman about the Hastings route. Despite the warnings, uh, he was given by Kleiman, Reed thought it was the appropriate route to take. Sarah and her group carried on, out escaping the boringness and emptiness of the Nebraska Plains, now encountering Chimney Rock in now western Nebraska. Look this up, it's so lame. I Some people told me to go there once, and uh, yeah. Alright, that night they met Jim Kleiman. He made it clear to the party that Oregon was the correct route. California was too tough to reach. By July 2nd, they arrived at Fort Laramie. The scene outside was less than ideal. The Sioux Indians had assembled a 2,000-strong fighting force around the camp to determined to fight their bitter enemies, the Crow. Despite the scenes, the travelers invited the Sioux Indians inside the camp on July 4th to join them in celebration. Whiskey was drunk, cannons were fired, and the day went about in celebration. Another cool uh, Native American fact, you know, just with the Sioux, in, Sioux and the Crow. I'm I'm enjoying these Native American facts that are sprinkled in. So the crow is. I thought you're about to give us a fact. <laughs> no, Sam, no, 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 no. I'm... <laughs> so too. No, no, no. The crow, the crow portion, I think, is loosely based off of Game of Thrones. Really? Yeah. What what brings you to that conclusion? Well, Game of Thrones, there was the crow, Brad. Oh, your chair is screaming. I'm oh, sorry. WD-40. I can't do anything about it right uh, now. Also, I forgot to mention this. Now you go. I was going to say something dumb. No, because I was about to just say that I don't have any thoughts on this chapter, so you go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I forgot to talk about this in chapters one and two, but I thought it was pretty cool how they, when they sold their land, they got all of the currents, like the different currencies, because they didn't know what they would really need, and then they put it I forgot exactly where they put it on their wagons, but they like hid it in the wagon. I think is where they put it. Yeah, that was cool to me, like having all the different possible types of currency. And I also, maybe Tyler can explain this to me. Why didn't they want the US dollar? Because it was, because there was a bank run. They didn't really trust it. So silver at least had its its worth in like materials, if that makes sense. Some things never change. People turn to silver and gold when the economy is going through a downturn. Shout out, Jen, our friend of Nick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> that was not my bingo card for no. this episode. Uh, maybe we nominate James Reed as our first motor moron for, despite listening to James Kleiman tell him this is a terrible idea, continuing on with the, the party. So maybe maybe he is our motor moron. Uh, yeah, it's tough to tough to get anyone over hasting. <laughs> Hastings yeah. just greedy, I think. I don't know if he's me stupid, but I mean, if you're if you're that's like if you know that no one can make it through, you're not gonna have. It doesn't matter because no families are gonna make it to California. So you might as well have them take the Oregon Oregon Trail, have them survive, and then lead them down to California. Yeah, make the sell at Oregon. He's also he's also gambling his own success on the fact that people can actually make it on this shortcut. Exactly. So in in that. He's a motor moron. Yeah, I think, yeah, okay. Maybe he is the motor moron, I agree. I also think, didn't, I think it came up like there was, people were questioning why Reed made this decision. I believe it comes up later on that Reed also has a stake in some sort of property in California, which is why he elected to go with the shortcut as opposed to going out to Oregon. Well, I, I think that, isn't that, doesn't that happen after he gets like banished from the group when he goes off alone? Yes, but I I think there were like considerations at this point though as as to what his motivations were. I th- you might be right that he decided later on. But I I think there was maybe some like I don't I won't call it foreshadowing, but um just a guess from the author that maybe something was preliminarily offered um at Fort Laramie to get Reed to go that way. Yeah. Could be. All right. One note I had about the, this chapter was Fourth of July must have been so fun. Like back when it was like less than fifty years after like America gained its independence, like 
I, that was just kind of a thought. Okay. It's, it's fun now, but imagine like 25 years after the, like, the revolution, like. You actually have a direct connection. Yeah. Pretty like, electric. To... Yeah. Yeah, it's not just a work holiday. <laughs> You probably party for the whole week. Like you probably, you probably like pre-game Fourth of July. Deserved. All right, Chapter Five: Deception. On July fifth, the Graves moved on from Fort Laramie, leaving behind most of the group, now joined by just two wagons. While many uh, still enjoyed the promise of Oregon and California, they were beaten down over the thousand miles they had traveled. On top of that, days were getting hotter. The elevation caused chilly nights, and mosquitoes, bees, and gnats followed the group in mass. In addition, it was getting tougher for the oxen. The travelers had arrived on drier land. As a result, most had to depart from their heavier possessions. This brought upon the most important question, whether to break for California or Oregon. The U.S. and Mexican War was now in full swing and brought upon mixed thoughts. By July 11th, a mysterious man was heading eastward. It was Wales B. Bonnie. On the road, chased by murder allegations back in Oregon, Wales was working for Hastings, who had a message for all the California-bound travelers. In the letter, it contained a promise about his path. The following day, the Donner and Reed party parties heard about Hastings and his desire to guide them along the way. To a party plagued by infighting and exhaustion, this must have come as a beam of hope. By July 18th, they reached the fork in the road and were forced to make a decision. The California group split and headed towards Hastings, electing James George Donner as their leader. Uh, the group was diverse. On paper, they had no chance in working together cohesively, filled with people of different backgrounds, religions, and ethnicities. Despite these many differences, they all agreed that the shortest route was the most enticing. Uh, well, there was one uh, dissenting opinion from Tamzine Donner, but she was a woman, therefore her opinion was cast aside. Meanwhile, Sarah and her family were a few days behind and reached the same fork. By August 3rd, they reached Fort Bridger, a couple of days after the Donner party had left to catch Hastings. At Fort Bridger, they found two cabins owned by Luis Vasquez and Jim Bridger. The Graves and the Donner party looked at them for guidance, and they gave reassurances that the Hastings route was perfectly fine. With that, they didn't know... Uh, what I'm sorry, what they didn't know was that they were merely trying to keep their business afloat. With that, the Graves left southwest in hopes of catching the Donner Party. Uh, the Donner Party carried on through the mountains, hoping to catch Hastings in early August. They traveled through the Wasatch Mountains in northeastern Utah. Three men rode ahead, hoping to find Hastings after he had left a note. They found him on August 7th. James Reed was able to get Hastings back to Mountain Pass as Hastings wished to rejoin the other party as quickly as possible. He showed them a vague route, and uh, and with that, they rode back. Once there, they found 15 others had joined the group, including the Graves. Despite the dangers, James Reed promised them there was a route ahead. The canyons proved tough, and by August 15th, the wagons could go no further. Given the stop, groups of men had to go ahead and chop down the brush and trees. After three days, they could carry on. Once they reached the top, they were greeted by more of the same. Finally, they reached modern-day Donner Hill. After a tough climb, they finally could breathe. On August 21st, they looked down upon the Salt Lake Valley uh, in hope. However, a seed of doubt was now growing among the party. Winter was approaching, and travel was becoming significantly slower. Could they trust the leaders of this group? For now, the group carried on. I guess this is the first real hitch in the journey. I mean, they, obviously, it's been tough up to this point, but uh, they kind of plant the seeds that that people start to doubt James Reed and the Hastings route because it's immediately challenging. Well, they make this promise of a shortcut. I'd be interested to see like when the group split, like the progress between the groups, because it sounds like they're going like, what, like a mile a day. It says in the following chapter. Yeah. Like I imagine yeah. at least like, although the Oregon trail might be a little bit longer, like they're definitely going to get there before. I mean, obviously that we know that they probably don't get there, but I can't imagine it's that much of a shortcut. Like, it's not. It's. I mean, you're traveling when you travel through mountains. It makes it significantly harder. I mean, that's almost common sense. <laughs> yeah, especially in the winter. I don't know why you don't just turn back at once you encounter the, the Wasatch. Is that what it's called? Like, just you're not that far down the road. Just go back and take the longer route. Just go back to Fort Laramie and be like, "Oh well, didn't work out." <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather live than like. Sure. They also, I mean, like in retro, obviously everything's in retrospect, but they could have just stayed at Fort Laramie for the winter. That's that's a good point from both of you. Why does the whole trip have to be made in one season? Why can't you just like camp out somewhere for a whole year? I think when we get to the final chapter, the there's going to be a lot of lessons learned uh, that future groups yeah. take into account. <laughs> I feel like that's partially like they won't have land really. I don't know what how they're gonna keep all their their uh livestock alive. Like what do you yeah. do with your livestock kind of? And I don't know. Yeah. I really... It's getting picked off by the by the yeah. Indians anyway. So like I I don't know if... I also don't know how much they cared about like death. Cause they were it talks about how I mean we know this like back in the day they just had so many offspring so many kids and it's just like yeah they're getting ran over by wagons like <laughs> death death is happening everywhere and they're just like all right let's keep moving type of deal that one dude who broke his leg on that horse I would have just asked for just just finish me off like yeah so on take this like, <laughs> they said his bone was like Kevin Ware I was just picturing like Kevin Ware like and just him sitting in that wagon like that would just be awful. They also like took in some. The Donners took in a kid with tuberculosis. Like why? Why? I I I mean, that, <laughs> kid with tuberculosis. Wow, Christian. <laughs> that sounds bad. But okay, I might be done talking. To you. Um, I mean, it, I mean, they were they were generous people. It sounded like like they just for whatever reason they were stuck on going to California no matter with this route, like. Bunch of bad decision makers. They were lacking a leader. Why why is the kid with tuberculosis traveling to California in the first place? That's Very a good question. Why was th there was a 70 year old with them or so like and just, just, wow. Wow. yeah. Last scene sitting up there in a tree. He's like that dude from the road, the old man from the road. <laughs> That's what I thought of too. Can't no longer make the journey. He, they didn't once consider that, oh, there might come a time where we have to make the journey on our legs. It is, it, 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 there's some, I mean, this book is just going to be a chapter after chapter of terrible decisions until they start eating each other. Um, all right. Uh, I think did Kevin, I don't know if Kevin knew that. It mentions that in the prologue. Wait, I didn't know I was that. Was, I was I was saying you were pause. Guessing. I didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, okay. Uh, I, all, I thought that was a guess, Brazel. I didn't know where you actually get to cannibalism. I remember it was mentioned in the summary, but you know, you only half listen to those when the person's <laughs> doing the Goodreads summary. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, chapter six. Uh, salt. Save that old man for dinner later. <laughs> he probably didn't have much meat on the bones. Uh, chapter 6, Salt, Sage, and Blood. Not like my girl Sarah Graves. Uh, the traveling party now descended into the great... <laughs> what? Wait, get, a wait. get a wagon of her own. Alright, all right. the traveling party now descended into the Great Lake Salt Valley. On August 25th, the group lost their first member to sickness, a young Luke Holleran uh, due to tuberculosis. <laughs> Shout out, Christian. Timing. Uh, death was common in the 19th century, and the rituals were often dictated by the family. The funerals were an opportunity to socialize, and every aspect was run by the family. This would change by the Civil War, as war brings many changes due to necessity. Uh, the group now traveled the trails of Hastings. By August 31st, they had reached the Salt Flats. They had hoped to only travel at night to avoid the beating sun. However, due to low grass and water supplies, they had to push forward for the majority of the day. As miles passed, it became clear this would be a big struggle. They would soon run out of feed for the oxen, slowing their pace. In addition, the sun took its toll, causing people to suffer migraines. After a tense few days, um, it became clear that the oxen couldn't reach Pilot Peak. With that, uh, men went ahead and secured water to return with. Over the next several days, the group would struggle to reach the base of the peak. Upon arriving at the springs, the group stayed for nearly a week, spending most nights trying to recoup their last lost oxen. By September 10th, the group saw the first signs of snow atop Pilot Peak, making one thing clear, they didn't have enough provisions to reach California. 
Given this, Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon stormed ahead for help. Uh, deterioration from the trip was beginning to take shape. First and foremost, the trip was physically demanding. The group had traveled nearly 1,600 miles. Secondly, hygiene was a disaster. Baths were nearly impossible, and body fluids began to cause stench issues. This paired with the fact that they could rarely wash their clothes. For weeks, the group traveled. On September 26th, they reached the Humboldt River in eastern Nevada. The shortcut had taken them 68 days, a month longer than their counterparts. Uh, since July 3rd, James Reed had kept a diary keeping minor details about the trip. However, it abruptly ended on October 5th due to a case of road rage, or oxen rage. In a dispute with John Snyder that escalated, James Reed stabbed Snyder to death. Despite the group debating if he should be hanged, they settled on banishing him with little provisions to the desert. Nonetheless, the group continued to pick up. Uh, uh, nonetheless, the group continued to struggle. Rations were being significantly depleted, and local Indian tribes continued to pick off their cattle. Groups were forced to abandon their carts altogether. The graves were among the most fortunate, still with oxen, and one of the first to find another source of water. Upon arriving at the river, the German emigrants arrived with the news Wolfinger had died. They claimed due to an Indian attack, but it later became clear they had killed him, in addition, using the opportunity to ransack his belongings. While hope was low, supplies did come. Stanton had finally returned without McCutcheon due to illness and brought necessary provisions, and news that he had passed James Reed. After being banished from the group, he had stormed ahead, uh, searching for the Donner Party. Upon meeting with them, he convinced Walter Heron to continue on with him in search of supplies. Soon enough, they were without food and struggling to carry on. However, they did um, end up meeting some Oregon travelers. By October 28th, they were nearly dead, but reached Sutter Fort. Uh, back to the Donner Party, they arrived on October 20th to the base of the Sierra Mountains along the Truckee Mountains, or modern-day Reno. They took the opportunity to gather themselves before continuing towards the mountain range. Soon enough, they carried on. William Pike and William Foster were sent ahead for additional supplies. However, Foster's gun accidentally discharged and struck Pike. For the first time in a while, the group paused and laid him to rest. While that, with that settled, they pushed for the canyons. On October 29th or 30th, they entered Dog Valley as the first signs of significant snow appeared. It snowed continually, and soon enough, their path was blocked by snowfall. So they had to retreat for now. Realizing the trip would get no easier, the group pressed on. Charles Stanton rode ahead, finding hope in the path ahead. However, when he returned, the group had settled in for the night, unable to carry on. The nightfall brought snow, which brought weight, which would only add to the upcoming horror. Uh, yeah, they're, they're getting trapped on top of this mountain. Little did they know, they were in some of the most expensive real estate in the U.S. right now. They should have just... Lake Tahoe, baby. <laughs> if only would they, if they would have just planted right there, their family fortune would have been guaranteed. Yeah, ski 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 lodge. Question: If if the salt flats were so like treacherous, why did the Mormons decide that that was their place to be? Why were they like this is our this is our sacred earth, this is where we want to be? No one just <laughs> thought someone would know. Let's ask our good friend. <laughs> Why did the Mormons choose Utah? That's probably a good question. Because they're holy lands in Missouri, so it is weird that they're in Utah. Huh. Shout out Birmingham Young University. Uh, so according to Google, um, the Mormons settled in the Salt Lake Valley, which at the time was used as a buffer zone between the Shoshones and the and the Utes who were at war. Upon arriving at Salt Lake Valley, the Mormons developed and cultivated the arid terrain to make it more suitable. Yeah. Interesting. Was that being a mediator? Uh, I... it looks like it looks like it was used as a buffer zone, so no one was living there, and so they just settled there and made it more livable. From my understanding of that quick Google search, it's probably more complex than that. But all right, let's go over. We we start to see, I guess. The author's kind of laying down, obviously, these are the, as the events unfolded, but we start to see the first couple deaths caused by people or people killing each other inside the group. We see James Reed getting in a battle and stabbing Snyder to death, and then we see the two German immigrants kill Wolfinger and then obviously play it off like they hadn't. But uh, you start to see the group start to crumble here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess this starts to accelerate. 
Lord of the Flies esque. Yes. Good, good pull. Good pull. Because as the situation gets yeah. more desperate, it's only going to get worse. That's a good way to put it. And and not even like direct, um, direct infliction of pain or murder against other human beings. They're starting to run into like accidental deaths. Um, exactly guns misfiring i don't know things things that you only put yourself into when you're in precarious situations like this you start to pay less attention to detail and accidents start to happen it's already difficult enough with the man versus environment conflict and then the man versus man woman versus woman man versus woman conflict that's gonna occur is just gonna make things 10 times worse so i do agree with tyler it's probably gonna escalate pretty fast here also like i was just thinking about like the some of the widows on the trail like when stuff starts going down they don't have like a guy to protect them like they're going to be like the first targets i feel like it's probably a good pick yeah. for first people to uh i don't remember how many but wagons are uh pause without a, a male counterpart but all right <laughs> um all right uh any predictions for obviously this was we're doing three parts so three videos for this one any predictions for the next uh it seems like they're gonna get trapped on the mountain and turn on each other any bold predictions i think that sarah graves makes it to california that might be a reason why he picked her so maybe a good prediction my bold oh, well, prediction it's said, it said earlier in the book that she makes it oh <laughs> i didn't even see it. that's how much i remember from the prologue spoiler <laughs> Um, my, bold prediction, my bold prediction is they find the uh, they find the cure to tuberculosis, but it's just too late. Poor Henry, sorry, <laughs> that'd be terrible. Um, his name's not even Henry; it's poor Luke. I think I think James Reed gets gets what's coming to him eventually. I think I don't think he's gonna turn back to the group, but. Uh, I feel like he survives and that, he runs away. I think he got let off the hook here because yeah. he, he said, forget about everybody else. I can move fast through the mountains and basically make it until before winter comes. Like I just abandoned uh, I don't think to a certain extent. I don't think he's yeah, I don't think he's that bad of a guy. I think he still loves his family. So maybe he does come back after a while when he realizes that they didn't make it through. And then he gets yeah. what's coming. Maybe he's the hero. Maybe he comes and saves him. Redemption. Uh, like Game of Thrones. Jon Snow gets sent to the wall by himself on a horse, comes back, saves his family, becomes a hero. History inspires art. Yeah. Might just be. They need like a, what I was thinking, they need like an Oregon Trail like video game, like a Red Dead. There. But for the Oregon Trail, that'd be sick. Oh, okay. You're saying, I, you're... Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was very confused. I was like, there is a. I played the game. Like, like Oregon Trail is like one of the most famous board games of all time. I was like, confused for a second. No, I get what you're saying. Like an open world video game. I yeah, say. I gotcha. Because that would be kind of crazy. Like Assassin's pick. Creed, but. Yeah, like, you get to pick your own path, like take your family, like go hunting. That'd be fun. Didn't it say at one point they like had, they were looking for food and they found like two beans on the ground? Yeah. They ate really one of the beans. Yeah. Reed and Watcher McCall, his uh, the guy that went with them. The coaching. rations, rations are low. They were like splitting. The... Imagine being that down bad that you find five dried beads, beans on the like ground, and you're like, okay, this is my safe. Also, do people know how to fish? Like they're walking next to streams this whole time. Like that, no one has mentioned fishing. Like I don't know if I just missed it, but That's like I feel like I feel like there's got to be. We're in the Rockies here. Like I know people. Don't really me, but. Do that is that a thing back? Like, did they know how back then? Besides, like harpoon, like spear fishing. I, I'm confident they knew how to they fish. How to fish? <laughs> like in that, because the Native Americans <laughs> used to fish. I thought it like, was like spear fishing. I guess they used like at least yeah, that's like you could use a net. Like I don't a basket or like a I don't know. I just feel like yeah, you're next to water like all this time. Like I, I, I they they I think... switch to, or at least try it. I think that when land is as sparse set it, as it is, like as far as hunting, like I think, I think game is game, no matter if 
it's in water on land. It's like if you're in a pretty sparse area, you're probably not going to have a lot of fishing opportunities either if you don't have hunting opportunities. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. I just thought it was weird that they never they haven't mentioned it once because they talk about like following the streams like through the through the rivers, so that's where the valleys are created, but yeah, interesting. Uh let's do we'll do parts you like about the book, parts you don't like about the book so far. That seems like it's just never ending tragedy. Like I, I don't know. I I hope there's more of a complete story as we go instead of it just being like this is this is where they went and these are the hardships they faced because i mean it's it's gonna be obviously we know they're gonna face hardships especially in the situation they're in now so i hope there's a little more we don't even have very much character development in my opinion like we we're not i'm not emotionally attached to any of these characters like if sarah died i'd be like (laughs) that's tough so Hopefully there's a little more of that. I do I do find the stuff pretty interesting because it's a lot of stuff we take for granted. And like Jared said at the beginning of this episode, we don't I don't know much about this time period. So like this Oregon Trail manifest destiny time period. So it is interesting to learn a lot of this stuff and what these people went through. But yeah, I guess piggyback yeah. about that. I, I've learned a decent amount. I wouldn't say like I'm the most like into the book yet, but I hope, I think, I think it's weird that we're also at a point like where we got like two thirds of the book left and it feels like this is where the story ends. So I'm interested to see how he flushes out the re- remainder of the book, because from what I know, the party doesn't travel too much further. I, there may be a few people that survive obviously, but I'd be interested to see how the pacing goes with what's about to come. So yeah, I guess. I almost feel the I feel like this is the start of the book almost, like that this was all the background to get to the, what we're about to experience. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like oh, okay. we're at that point now. Like in like, like they're not going to move very much. There's no more of this huh. travel. Like what happened? But we'll probably that. we'll probably I think we're going to um go in more detail about some of the actual people on the journey now. Because they're gonna have to communicate with each other significantly more. That's what I hope. Because like what Kevin said, I don't have have a hard time connecting with people, and I feel like he mentions that he picked Sarah Graves as like the, the focal point, but I feel like I really don't know that much about her. So I'm hoping that we either dig into like the reason why she was picked, or and whatnot. So I there so far for me, there are too many characters. And there's too much back and forth between different groups of characters to the point where it's kind of hard to follow. So I kind of hope the same thing where this is like the start and this sort of isolation that they found themselves in allows the author to focus in on on this group and to get a little bit more detailed and what exactly they went through as opposed to jumping from scene to scene and place to place and um, giving uh giving like a generalistic amount of information rather than fine details honestly i also feel like everything has been expected so far like i i i I need a little bit more uh shock value i need a little bit more surprise i need like i need some unbelievable events to take place like holy shit i can't believe that humans would do that to other humans I mean, there's a big storm coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is also the guy that said he wanted the kid with tuberculosis to get left behind. So he just wants he just wants human human bloodshed. Yeah, he just wants human suffering. That's why he wants. Him. Uh, one other. Thing. I need I need some surprise. If if this were written in like this is giving me almost great game vibes. Like there's just in terms of character amount, and thank goodness that this is written in a time period and in an area that I can understand because if this were put in like the setting of the great game, it'd probably be pretty similar for me where like, I have no idea what's actually, I feel like it to me, it feels like endurance. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's just day by day events going on, but endurance at at least to this point, did a lot better job of like introducing you to the characters. And like, you felt like at least a connection, like we knew who William was, who was like, 
who was the guy that uh, motor trained less? Sh- well, Shackleton and like Ordelis. Yeah, we Ordelis. like we knew the characters and their roles. Like I feel like in this we like I couldn't name like everyone that's in the party because like they're just tons of hopping around. Whereas like no, I feel like this is our first. I think maybe it, time. I th- like I think maybe it gets slow. to the point. I think maybe it gets to the point of the endurance. Uh, maybe not the fact that everyone survives, but I think maybe because of the isolation, we start to learn a little bit more about the the group that was directly impacted, the actual Donner party, rather than like whatever other parties they've discussed so far. Yeah, and endurance had like diaries too. I I, I remember correctly, like there was there was some decent like stuff to pull through and like create a story with whereas this is kind of like a lot of like he mentions walking the trail himself and like from his experience he fills in the gaps and yeah i guess the big difference is they were sitting on a piece of ice unable to do anything and these people were walking all day so it was like yeah but now they're gonna be stuck in a spot with yeah not being able to do anything so i guess you are kind of making a good point i guess i I'm also gu- i'm guessing where it is going yeah this uh I feel like we have this discussion every first meeting where we're like, yeah, this is kind of slow. Yeah. That's which is true. like, it's just a necessary evil of books. Like we got to get like this background. I think it will pay dividends. Yeah. Probably if you go back through most of our meetings outside of red notice and killers of the flower moon, I think probably almost all of them have had the first meeting a little slow, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Like you, the author just has to set it up. Yeah. That's just like. Has any part of you guys thought to yourself while reading this initial stage that this shit would be easy? Yeah. That you could do it. If I... only, if only you, if only you had some common sense and took, <laughs> and took the, the, for once you take the road more traveled instead of less traveled. Give me a dose of mercury. I feel like it wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> Hey man, hey, if you think you can get through it, we'll set you. Hey, maybe we just send Kevin and Christian out there. I'm telling you, if this this is the I, fastest way for us to grow subscribers. We could, imagine if we just launched on social media that we were walking the Don, the Donner Party <laughs> trail, and Tyler, we we're gonna film it all. I guarantee you, we'd have it. Donner Party. Like, <laughs> Tyler and Donner Darren. Party IRL. Donner Party speed run. <laughs> Jokes on us, so two of us have to eat each other at, <laughs> in the Sierras. Tyler and Jared could get like one of those travel vans and have all the cameras and drones and all that stuff. And Christian and I will just, we can't sleep in the van. We just got to sleep right outside it. Yeah, like, for, forget uh, training for the marathon. You're training now to walk the Donner Party Trail. Look what I just found. The annual Donner Party hike offers one or two days of immigrant history and more. Six guided hikes. So you get one well, or two days. Yeah. Let's, let's let's reach out to the the company doing that. We'll ask for a free trip out there, and we'll do it. That's yeah. We'll, how about that? We'll say that if they fly us out there and pay for our and pay for us to do the hike, we will go out and do the Donner Party hike. Just to see the Sierra Mountains. Mean, it would be so anticlimactic. Yeah. Like gas yeah, station. We'd be we'd station. be like taking pictures on like selfie like at the. <laughs> probably all right uh any other thoughts before we transition to the competition i think we covered everything no i think we had this was one of our better breakdowns i think uh if we dissected it this very well so jared tell them where they're reading to uh for the next meeting that was really rude of you because you just put me on spot (laughs) so give me a second We will be reading from chapters uh, seven, seven through. God, what is page two hundred three? Pages one nineteen through two hundred three. Or pay, yeah, so chapters seven through. It's 11. chapter twelve. Oh. Yeah, to chapter twelve, yeah. So four chapters. Yeah, there's some pretty long chapters, so yeah. it's not. But yeah, so like we said, a little bit of less reading for this book because we wanted to spread it out. The three meetings because we we're reading some books on the side um but yeah I, i'm excited to see where this goes moving forward um and with that we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with some scriblio as christian looks to defend his title and i look to get on the board because right now <laughs> and I'm i i look to not finish last place on a scriblio yeah all right see you then
Okay, welcome back to the competition portion of today's episode. Uh, for episode one, the boys will be partaking in a little scriblio uh, with yours truly being the uh, defending champion and holding <laughs> the title for every session of scriblio that we have done as a group. So today... Uh, Jared and Tyler seek to get their first test, seek to defend, and Kevin seeks to reclaim his throne. Well, the because I'm cutting. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those who are listening, uh, me and me and Tyler are still trying to get on the board. Scribble Christian is defending, um, and Kevin is has been the goat. Uh, so let's see what yeah, happens. I just, I just said that. What wasn't clear about it. You cut out the like your last your last half part, so I'm just filling in the gaps for those. Uh, oh, but no, thank you. Let's play ball. Let's play ball. Let's. I think we. Mm. This is a lot more competitive now, so I'm excited. I haven't been competitive, but not yet. Well. Oh, why is it always me first? Why always me? Okay, 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 okay. okay, okay. Oh, my scribbly is being slow. All right, <laughs> oh, quick guesses. Oh. Let's go. Let's go. Quick guess. I'm not going to lie. I was looking at the top and I saw three question marks and I thought that meant it was three letters. Oh, I, I hit like, that. I hit that. You hit him. Oh. Is that a volcano? What? So I'd look at cousins right now. Oh my god. Oh no, that's that's not what I wanted to do. Oh no. Oh no, Christian. Oh Christian's collapsed. I don't know how else to draw this. <laughs> oh no, Christian's collapsed. Like look what he's typed in the chat. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess that. Oh, it wasn't a great drawing. Oh right. <laughs> oh god. Wow, quick, quick guesses. Oh, wow. Wow, okay. Uh, I don't like I don't like my words. That was a good drawing, Kevin. Nice. How do you feel? Nope, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm so lost to what I'm looking at. Come on, guys. Wait, maybe I should. Uh, sir. There we go. Okay, at least I. Oh, no fucking way. At least I know Kevin got it. That. Tyler, this is an all time bad drawing, not gonna lie. I can't even. Sp I, I have no idea what this is. I. I I, I, you know, I don't know if I can do any better. It's actually, it's not I... that bad, but not having the, oh, not having the handles. Oh my, oh my, what? That was, a, that was, I <laughs> got in the last second. Out. That yeah. was, you could have drawn a pig. <laughs> oh, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah, some of these words are tough when you get them. Try not to reuse words, just since you're like. Oh, how am I going to draw this? Check. Pepper. Someone got the pepper. There we go. Uh, teaspoon. It's a good drawing. Food. Christian, this is a good drawing. Rations. Oh, this is a disaster. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. This is a tough one. Yeah. I, it's not a, I figured it out. Not a bad drawing. 
I just it was a good drawing. It was just uh the coffee helped me at the end. All right, wow. Surprise. Jared's in the lead. Yeah, Kevin and Jared up there. Boopy. Just need to pick the right word for it. <laughs> Finally got it. Yeah. Nice. Today, what? Is I can't. It? I can't. I can't draw any better than it. It's just, just you gotta get the right word. Just try not to finish last. That's my only goal. I think you might get me today, Tyler. I can't guess today. It appears. That's, that's my only. Guess. Kevin are ten ten points apart. That's yeah, a tight tight one up the up. Oh God! This is these three words are brutal. Fuck. I had a two, I had two repeats, so I couldn't. Uh... Oh, I know it. Oh wow! I did not know you guys were gonna hit that. All right, I'm coming back. I'm storming. Yeah. Storming, Norman. Uh wow, oh, that was that was, that was, that was going. Why the fuck am I always last? <laughs> Your internet's screwing you, screwing you. All right, we got two more rounds still to play. Dang, that might be the deciding for the game right there. And we got three hundred. I don't want Phil. Bang! Bang! I'm coming back. Dang. Yeah, Tyler's a... I'm surging. Christian Etzer. Claim and defending champ. Come on. Come on, what? This is a bad Now one. I'm lost. Now I'm lost. Oh no. Oh no, oh no, it's a collapse now. <laughs> Christian. Oh my god. Oh yes, yes. I I don't this is gonna be tough to draw. I I why can't is it like this spell? Oh <laughs> the spelling is tough. Come on. This this spelled it wrong? That was huge for the uh oh. The... Uh -oh. It is close. Oh God! Couldn't spell oh, the word. Hot. Saved my life. I only have one choice. Wait, yeah, I only have one choice. Oh my God! I posted last time. It's... God damn! Oh no! Oh, that was huge! I didn't that I that I got that mail. I think that's going to screw them up. Oh, fucking no. The more that Kevin drew, the more you're going to screw him up. I don't know what's going on here. I'm sorry. I don't know. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I drew the same thing as I did the one before. That's That's a tough word. I know what the f God damn it. I couldn't type the word fast enough. I was like, Dumb. all right, heading into the final round. We got a tight one up top. I'm behind. Five we, points we difference. Do, wow. We we need to do more than uh, four rounds. I don't know how this... Uh, differently. Yeah. I know how this is going to turn out. Kevin's going to take the lead. Oh, God. Oh. I got last because I could. I typed it wrong twice. All right. I think you were. I think you were last time. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the. I am way behind. I, 
I need like three in a row of first place here. I'm just happy I put up a performance this time. I saved I Jared there. Whole points for me. Yeah, I, I saved Jared. <laughs> Kevin needs God. Jared not to get this, but me and but me and Christian too. Sun. Light. I don't know what burnt. Heck? Fever. Um uh, Kevin. <laughs> 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 well, that's tough. I thought this is the only word I could use, and I thought doing this would help you guys. I am just lost. I don't. <laughs> um, I have no clue what this man is drawing. <laughs> I don't know what it. I don't want to call it a bad draw again. I need to see the word, but. He's there. Mercury. Mercury. the same thing. Oh, I mean, uh, I don't think it's I, totally positive. I just didn't know that was even in the word bank, I guess. Also, Earth is just definitely the fourth planet, isn't it? No, that's Mars. Never mind. Right. Oh, no, I know this one. Come on, baby. Oh, no. It's me. That may not help at all. I know what that's supposed to be. I, I think I may have it read. Like oh, yeah, that looks like killing. Yeah. I, I tried to draw a rose. rose. Wow. Yeah. All right. I'm happy that I came close. I was on the podium. Yeah, yeah I was. You were right. That was, the best, that was our best game thus far in terms of competition. Definitely. We might have to extend it moving forward. I agree with Christian. It's gotten a lot more intense. We need, we need, and it goes fast too. I like six rounds would be solid. Well, it's crazy because like over time we've we've been uh, has to be more. We were so bad. We were so bad at the start, but now we go quick. Like it's it's fast, yeah. and we're getting better. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, uh, well, I guess as a result, I would definitely watch this on YouTube and if you're interested in following along because that was uh, pretty intense. Probably one of our better games. Um, so On the board. Yeah, finally got on the board. I was I was getting worried. Uh, couldn't let these guys leave us in the dust. Leave me in the dust. Um, but yeah, that does it for our first meeting for the Indifferent Stars Above. Uh, for next week, we're going to be reading chapters uh, 7 through 11, I believe. So pages 116 through 203, I believe. Um, and yeah, so we'll see where this book picks off. Uh, and then next week we'll be doing a uh, meme competition. So I have a feeling the guys will have some, this should be a, hopefully an all timer in the meme comp. Uh, I think, I think the, the juices should be flowing for this one. Um, so looking forward to a great episode next week. Thank you guys all for watching and we'll catch you guys. Peace. Bye.